So, Lord, thank you. Thank you, thank you. We just declared this is a divine appointment for all of us. And we're amazed at how you can speak to each one of us individually and corporately in the same passage of Scripture. It's just amazing. Uh, your word is truly living and active, sharper than a two-edged sword. So we'll give you praise, we'll give you glory, we'll give you honor. You alone are worthy. You alone are worthy. Thank you, Jesus. And we pray it in your name, Lord. Amen. Amen, amen. So um, in Exodus 33, in fact, I will take, uh, I know that I, I don't ridicule, I'm, I don't make fun necessarily. I, I'm always making comments about grace and Dolores having their amplified, but actually the Bible that I bring with me is the amplified. <laughs> it's, so, it's not what I use up there typically, but, but let me open my amplified Bible to Exodus 33. Um, get past all these different bookmarks that get in the way of getting to Exodus 33. The Amplified is, it's like it's talking louder, you know, because it's Amplified. But um, if you if you notice, if you have your your technology word, or if you have your real live hardcover word. Um, if you look in, in Exodus 32, you'll notice that they um, took all their gold and they made a calf. See all that in Exodus 32? Just skimming down. They got Aaron to do it. It was, it's funny, once Moses comes down and says, what is going on here? You Parents, you know exactly what that's like. You walk into a room and you go, what is going on here? And then they say things that you go, that didn't even make sense. And it's like, so Aaron said, look, this golden calf just popped out. <laughs> like, like, Oh, yeah, okay, I'm sure it just popped out. <laughs> Nobody had anything to do with it. A golden calf just appeared. And um, and they end up, uh, the Levites go through. And 3,000 died. Right? Exodus 32, 3,000 died. Um, when we talk about Pentecost, this is the first Pentecost. 3,000 died. That's why I so you got a more, better, much better covenant because our first Pentecost after the cross, 3,000 were saved. You see that parallel? Um, so I want you to see the context of Exodus 33. Um, and then just scan on in 33, and Moses has this conversation. We're getting ready to look at a piece of it. Uh, right after this has taken place. So he's been up on the mountain, got these tablets from God, and uh, it's going to get quieter in here now because I closed my Amplified. <laughs> I'm sorry. It's just, it's the Amplified, you know. Yeah. Um, and so uh, He had gone down the mountain, the golden calf thing, which is really interesting. Before he went up the mountain, remember, the Lord wanted to talk to all of them, and the people said, no. You remember that? They said, no. You go up on the mountain. Because <laughs> remember, it was thunders, and there's the cloud on top of the mountain, and it's like really scary. And the people say, oh, no, no, you go up and talk to God <laughs> and come back and tell us what he says. And we will do whatever he says. It's, see, that's a shame because I don't know if I don't know if the law of Moses had been in the plan because they had been operating on the covenant of Abraham. Do you realize that? Yeah. Since Abraham, they had been operating on the covenant with Abraham, and they sent Moses up on the mountain. They did not want a relationship themselves with God. They wanted a mediator to tell them what God said, and they said, we will obey everything he says. 
they set up the whole thing with the law. And while Moses was gone talking to God, they broke the first two commandments that were written on the stone. They had a God, and they worshiped a God. While Moses was up there, you know, he comes down. And remember, Joshua had gone halfway up. Y'all remember that, right? Joshua's always hanging around Moses in the presence. And Joshua had gone halfway up and was waiting for Moses. And so they're coming down, and they're like, what's that sound? Is it war? I think, I think Joshua said, is it war? And Moses said, oh, no, that's not war. <laughs> Somebody's having a blast. A hedonistic party, <laughs> kind of thing. And, um, and got down there, and there's the whole what, what's going on here. And um, you can almost hear Aaron say, I didn't want to do it. You know, didn't want to do it. I mean, it just popped out, but I didn't want to do it. I told them not to. They made him. They made him. They made him. Which, which is such an example of how we desire mixture because he's, he's going to be the high priest. And he's already been with Moses and things, you know, as part, and he was in charge. And so they wanted Aaron, but they wanted Aaron to do an idol, you know, kind of thing. Because mixture is typically what we're, we want a little bit of God, but we don't necessarily want all of God. We want, we want some areas that we do our own thing. And so, um, so anyhow, the golden calf, 3,000 die, and then he goes back up the mountain uh, for another time with the Lord. So again, that's the context. 3,000 had just died. There had been the whole golden calf. Moses had broken the tablets that God had made, and he's going back up to get more tablets. Just, just tell you a little bit about the tablets before we go much further, just because it's cool. Um, most of you, your image of the tablets is a picture in your Bible, or maybe Charlton Heston with the white hair and all that. Charlton Heston holding the tablets. And typically, um, the way it's portrayed is half of the commands are on one tablet and half are on the other. It's actually two copies of the commandments. Uh, all ten on both stones. Because the practice, uh, you know, we talked some about covenant and the practice of covenant. And there's a covenant that Abraham enters into that's a blood path. There's another type of covenant that kings often entered into and they would come and they would make an agreement many times with a blood path involved and then they would make a summary statement of the agreement, of the treaty, of the covenant. So the 10 or the summary statement for all of Leviticus, you know, the Levitical law, there's about 613 or so commands in the law. The 10 are the summary, the essence of the whole law. And so each would make... Uh, a tablet, in this case, of that summary of the whole relationship, the whole covenant relationship. And one king would take one of those tablets and the other king would take the other tablet and they would go put those tablets in their most treasured place. So sometimes they would end up in the throne room, sometimes they would end up in the king's personal treasury, uh, sometimes they would end up in the king's temple, you know, whatever God he served or whatever. We don't get what was happening here. Moses brought both copies to put in the Ark of the Covenant, the Ark of his presence, because God said, my most holy place is your most holy place. Isn't that cool? That's cool. That's also a little rabbit trail because it's not really on topic, but I just like that a lot. There's, there's a lot of stuff in, in what they were doing. Uh, and the whole tabernacle, the tabernacle is totally a revelation of Jesus. Totally. And it's, it's cool to teach on that, but I'm not doing that either. I just, I just want to look at this little picture of Moses back up on the mountain for the second time. And let, let's just think a little bit about Moses. Moses is a murderer. You remember that, right? Killed a man. And uh, then had the vamoose. Now, some, some 
know this and some don't. Tr tradition is that obviously Moses grew up in Pharaoh's house. Uh, from best we can tell, Moses was a mighty general that won territories for Pharaoh, for Egypt. So he, he was not just considered one of Pharaoh's sons, but he was a general of the army with conquests and victories. He was a man of renown, not just the son of the Pharaoh. He was a man of renown. And so for him to kill that Egyptian who was abusing the Hebrew slave, uh, it would be real easy not just to think of him who, as breaking the law, but someone who could literally do a rebellion. Somebody who could literally lead the army against Pharaoh and take the throne. So that was, there's a big thing between the lines that you don't get in him fleeing Egypt. So then he come, becomes a you know, shepherd for 40 years. It's nothing like being all the way to the Joint Chiefs of Staff at the White House and then living somewhere in Montana under the radar <laughs> for 40 years, right? Maybe it was New Mexico, I don't know, somewhere out of the way. And uh, he's just tending flocks. And he sees that burning bush. And this is important for us to remember, too, because the burning bush discombobulated him. I'll try it over here. So let me, let me talk to Becca. Becca, the burning bush discombobulated Moses. It freaked him out. He sees a bush on fire, no smoke, and it's not being consumed. And it's like, he's like, what? <laughs> and then it starts talking to him, and he was discombobulated. It also may mean he may have wet his robes a little. I don't know. <laughs> but, but he, you know, he had to take his, take his shoes off on holy ground. He, there's a whole thing with throw your staff down, and it's a snake. And there's a whole thing about go to Egypt, get my people. And Moses in the midst of it was like, I can't do that. And he makes all these excuses, which is interesting because he was Pharaoh's son and he was a mighty general. Those are excuses. When he says he's got a stammering tongue, excuses. He's trying to get somebody else to do it instead of him. It's Chris Christopherson. Why me, Lord? Some of you don't remember that. Some of you don't want to remember it because you heard it all the time for a while. <laughs> and and the Lord goes through, and, and finally he says, well, who am I going to say? And remember, the Lord says, I am that I am. And, and that's, a great, that's a great thing right there. I am that I am is with you. And so that's a little bookie, and I want you to remember that. So, so then, gone to Egypt, all the plagues. All the plagues were specific attacks on specific gods that the Egyptians worshipped to show that God was the true and the living God. And Pharaoh, before each one, had the opportunity to just say God was the only God and let his people go, and he refused. And so one by one, he went through the house of gods for Egypt and showed he was the one who was the true and living God. And then he brings them out with a mighty hand. There's that last, there's that last God right there at the Red Sea. If Pharaoh thinks he's got him and that the, his God has delivered those people into his hands. And no, God showed he was greater than, what is it, Baal Peor or whatever the, the God was there. And now they've come literally, this is right after that, and they're at the mountain. When you go to the back of your book, it'll show you Mount Sinai on the Sinai Peninsula. That probably is not Mount Sinai. Did you know that? Probably Mount Sinai is in Saudi Arabia. It's called the mountain of God. And you can actually, Saudi Arabia doesn't let you go and do tourists there or anything, but people who've gone in there, you can actually see archaeological evidence of the whole encampment and a mountain that had a furnace on top. Things are melted. 
And so the traditional spot is a nice traditional spot, and it's not that you can't go there and get, you know, goosebumps and, and, and all that kind of stuff, but it's probably not the genuine mountain of God. It's probably the mountain of God in Saudi Arabia. And like I say, there's evidence, archaeological evidence of the whole encampment and things that go with Scripture. So he goes up, comes down, breaks the tablets, kills people. He doesn't kill people, but, you know, they, people are judged. And now he's gone back up. So you got the context? All right, cool. So now let's look. Show me your glory. Yes, Lord. Looks like a cleft in the rock, doesn't it? Cleft in the rock. I should probably find this little channel changer. Man and his remote shall not soon be separated. So, uh, show me your glory. So Moses says, now show me your glory. It's a long way from like, who am I to go? You know, show me your glory. So Exodus 33, 12, Moses said to the Lord, you have been telling me, lead these people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. You have said, I know you by name, because that's an intimate thing to know somebody by name. Because not only... Obviously, does God know Moses by name, but Moses knows God by name. And you have found favor with me. That word favor, I want to talk about for a second. But, but again, notice as this conversation, uh, because of what the people had done, the Lord, the Lord had said, I'm going to send an angel with you. I'm not going myself. So that's one reason they're having this little discussion. But that word favor means graciousness. It means grace. It means kindness. It means pleasantness. It means to see someone as precious. So God is saying, Moses, you have found favor with me. Right? Or Moses is saying, have, if I've found favor. There's two or three different ways. Same word runs through here. So um, Moses says, you said that you know my name and that I've found favor with you. And it's goodwill, it's gracefulness, it's elegance, it's acceptance. But I want you to just sort of see grace and like precious. That what God is saying is, I see you in grace or I see you as precious. Right? And that's, that's what, when you see favor in this passage, that's the word that's being talked about. The, the first time that's used in Scripture Noah found favor. Yeah, you see? That's, that's the kind of thing. Oh, Angie's jumping ahead and hitting rest. That's coming later. That's coming in in, in a second or so, but she went on and jumped in. Because he also says to Noah, in fact, in fact, Noah means rest. Right? So, um, but anyhow. So, so that's where we are with this. And, and this is interesting. Here's another thing I want you to think about. Just with this verse. Now look, Moses is talking to the Lord, capital L-O-R-D. So that means Yahweh. That means I am that I am, which is the name from the burning bush when he talked to him. You have been telling me. So he, Moses, is, Moses is talking to God and giving it to him. You've been telling me. Let me remind you. When you pray the scripture, you're reminding God what he said. When you pray the scripture, you're saying you want the harvest on the word that the Lord has spoken. And you're saying that you understand that the word of God performs. So Moses says, you've been telling me, lead these people. And first time was at that burning bush. But you have not let me know whom you will send with me. Because he's been thinking that God himself is going to go with them. And now it's gotten switched because of what they just did. You've said, so Moses is still reminding God as if God may have forgotten, I know you by name and you have found favor with me. So Moses said, you're saying that I'm precious to you and that I have grace. Now remember, the law came by Moses. Grace and truth came by the Lord Jesus Christ. Right? That's in John chapter 1. Right? Remember that? 
So the law came by Moses, a servant, but grace and truth came through a son. It's also in John. It says that Jesus was full of grace and truth. So if there's grace, if somebody's finding favor in God's eyes, it's because of Jesus. Just, just, so, so, you know where we're going. If Moses had found favor, you already have favor because you belong to Jesus. This is before the cross. But favor, grace, only comes by Jesus because he's the one that's full of grace and truth. So Moses had stepped into a relationship even better than Abraham's, but Abraham was in a Jesus relationship. Moses is in a Jesus relationship, but the people are about to go into a law relationship with the sowing and reaping law because that's what the law of Moses is. If you do this, this is the harvest. If you do this, if you plant this seed, this is the harvest. That's what blessings and curses, when he lays before them in Deuteronomy 28, blessings and curses. Do this and you get this harvest. Do this and you get this harvest. So when it says that God brings judgment on them, he doesn't really bring judgment on them. They've planted seed for a harvest and he removes his hand because he's been holding that harvest away from them out of his mercy. And he finally removes his hand so their harvest can overtake them. Right? Seed time and harvest from the very beginning. And that's the law. Unless you belong to Jesus, then it's grace. You can get a different harvest than you sowed for. So here's Exodus 33, 13, and 14. Good night. This feels good already. I ain't even got to the good parts. It already feels good. Okay. Can't just stand up here and tingle by myself. So here, although that could have a bad connotation for somebody. So never mind. Exodus 33, 13, and 14. If you are pleased with me, Moses is still talking to God. If you're pleased with me, you said that you don't be by name and I've found favor. If you're pleased with me, teach me your ways. Your ways. Now let's do a pause here. Your ways. What are the ways? What does that mean? Ways are roads traveled. You know, there are some roads that are traveled that you got to do more road work on because they're traveled more frequently. Right? A road less traveled gets grown up, but everything's pretty much there. A road that's traveled often, you get these deep paths, these deep gullies. You ever seen those old wagon ruts? for roads that were traveled often and had, you can't get out of the rut. You'd be messed up. So roadways as trodden journeys, manners, ways, directions, habits, moral character, course of life, mode of action. So he's saying, show me your ways. The first time this word is used is when the angels went to Eden to guard the way to the tree of life. Because the way of God is life. But they chose death. And he didn't want them to live in their death forever, so he put angels there to guard the way to life. Because God's ways are life. If you belong to Jesus, life and life abundant. Right? Cool. So teach me your ways so I may know you and continue to find favor, this graciousness, this, this uh, preciousness with you. Remember that this nation is your people. <laughs> like, don't, don't blame me for them. <laughs> They're your people. And the Lord replied, again, Yahweh, I am that I am. My presence, so he's reneging. He said, I'm going to send an angel instead. My presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. So presence means face. Yes, my face. The face of the Lord. 
Literally, it means the face as in the part that turns. My face is turned this way. My face is turned this way. My face is my face. The face, the presence. Moses wants to always be in the face of God, which is interesting when we get to the part about the hinder parts. The face. God says, my face, my presence will go with you. First time that's used is when the Spirit of God hovered above the waters. Genesis 1-2. The presence of God hovered above the waters because things are about to get spoken and things are about to take place, right? And rest, Angie already went ahead of us a while ago. The first time that's used is when the ark came to rest on Ararat. Came to rest. And it means to settle down, to dwell, to stay, be quiet, to remain, to sit down. I like it. To sit down. When Jesus had finished the work, he sat down at the right hand of the Father. Isn't that cool? Sat down. <laughs> it means to set oneself down anywhere to take a rest with a remote and a football game and popcorn. <laughs> and quietness all around. Not people going, well, who's that team? What does that make? No, no, just, just so you can enjoy the game. I mean, that's, a, that's an enjoyable thing. It's not as enjoyable as just being able to watch it with maybe a son who understands what's going on as opposed to people you have to explain. Have you seen that thing online? It's called, what is it? Mama Does NFL Logos. Is that what it is? And she like butchers everything. And they finally show her the Green Bay Packers and she's like, oh, I got this one. The Giants. <laughs> and the, the dad's like, Y'all don't care, but it's precious to me. It finds favor in my sight, and I love to rest in front of it. So, um, so notice so far, he's got favor. He wants to know the roadways of God or the paths of God so he can continue to have favor he doesn't want to take the control of the nation because the nation belongs to God. And because of that, God says, my face will go with you. So, for example, a much smaller scale, I say to the Lord all the time, these people are your people. This house is your house. That property is your property. I say that over my own house. This house and this property belongs to you for kingdom purposes. You guard this place, right? I left this morning and I said, angels of protection around all of the Lord's property. I even prayed it over Miss Joyce, my neighbor, because she was going into her house and I love her. So Exodus 13, 33, 15 through 16, Moses still talking. Moses is just a yammer, and he's feeling his oats talking to God up there after that big golden calf incident. Moses said to him, if your presence does not go with us, do not send us up from here. That's really interesting. Let me look and see if I made a note, because I do want to say something. I didn't make a note, but I do want to say something. Notice that. Look at your translations. Y'all have different translations. See how many of your translations have something about going up from here. If your presence does not go with us, do not send us up from here. Just like most of you got something that it says something about going up from here. Anybody? Is it worded that way? Yeah. He's on a mountain. Where are you going to go up to from there? He's on a mountain. Now, it's interesting because when you went to Jerusalem, wherever you were coming to Jerusalem from, you had to go up to go up to Jerusalem, which is the place that will eventually bear the Lord's name. And that's why they had Song of Ascents. So 
I like this because it seems to indicate if your presence doesn't go with us, we can't go up. The only way I can ascend is in your presence with you because your throne is high and lifted up. And look, if you live in grace because you know Jesus, you are seated with him in heavenly places. There's a piece of you in the spirit that is already at rest in his face, his presence at the throne. There's a piece of you saving your seat. That's cool. That's cool because it's not like my dad's up there saving my seat. You know? Right now I'm standing here and there's a piece of me seated in heaven saving my seat for the rest of me to show up. Does that boggle your mind? You're already seated in heaven. You already have rest in heaven because you already have favor, grace. You're already in his presence. All the stuff that Moses wanted, you already have. Amen. Yeah, that's cool. I think that's cool. I think that's real cool. Let me see if I wrote anything. I didn't. I've already checked. I didn't write anything down there. It's just me going off on stuff. So let's see. Did I read the rest of it? <laughs> okay, yeah. Okay, so uh, go up. Okay. How will anyone know? This is all about distinguish. How will anyone know that you're pleased with me and with your people unless you go with us? Right. What else will distinguish me from everybody else on earth? It, and that stands to reason. If the living God is in me, that's what he said, right? I'll give you my spirit. Jesus prayed in John 17 that I'd be in him, he'd be in me, all that kind of stuff. If I'm in him and he's in me, Jesus said, I'll never leave you, I'll never forsake you, right? I'm always with you. Then people ought to somehow be able to see that God is with me. And the only way that they won't see it is if Danny's too much flesh. Because Danny's flesh will cover the presence of God in my life by my flesh doing stuff. But if I will get my flesh out of the way, the presence of God will make a distinction between me and everybody else. Yeah, okay, all right. That doesn't excite you. It excites me. Verses 17 and 18. And the Lord says, so now the Lord's talking back. Yahweh's talking back. I will do the very thing you've asked. Now, now check this out. This is crazy. I'll do the very thing you asked. He's a murderer. He tried to do, when he finally embraced the commission that God gave him, he tried to do it in his flesh and had to flee and cost them 40 years. Yeah. Yeah. Moses cost, the, well, probably 30 years. God told Abraham, your people will sojourn in Egypt for 400 years. It was 430 years. Moses had been chosen as the deliverer, but he didn't check with God about how to do it. When he embraced his commission, he tried to do it in his strength and had to run and cost those people 30 more years of slavery because he tried to do God's will in his own flesh, which is not how you do God's will. We may have promises that were supposed to already be fulfilled, but our flesh has gotten in the way to delay our destinies. And my guess was the last 30 years of slavery was worth worse than the years before. So Moses, in trying to do it in his own strength as general of Egypt, cost the people of God dearly, the descendants of Abraham dearly. Does that make sense? Okay, just checking. So the Lord says to Moses, 
you guy <laughs> that messed up really bad and you people down there just messed up really bad? In that context, he says, I'll do the very thing you've asked. We have not for we ask not. We have not for we ask not. We actually say, oh, he'll do it for somebody else because they're special, but he won't do it for me. So you just canceled your whole harvest because you just disagreed with your destiny. Ask. Ask big stuff because God can do immeasurably more than you can ask or think. Moses asked, I'll do the very thing you've asked. Moses didn't have the blood of Christ. I'll do the very thing you've asked because I am pleased with you and I know you by name. So Moses is like, I'm on a roll. I'm on a roll now. I got me some mo. When I was playing ball, when momentum was on my side, I loved it. It was the most fun ever. When momentum was on the other side, it was horrible. Moses feels some traction now. He's got some momentum. He's got a good word. So he's going for the gusto. Oh, is that a beer commercial? He's going for it. He is going for it. Now show me your glory. He's got the favor of God. He's got the grace of God. He's got the presence of God. Lord has called him precious. He's seen the supernatural over and over and over again. And he's just going for it. There's something beyond the presence. There's something beyond his face. How do you know? Because he already had that and he's going for it. Show me your glory. Now show me your glory. Moses has something in mind there. Show me your glory. Let me just make sure I ain't got a note that I don't want to miss there. Show me your glory. Okay. All right. Well, I will. I'll tell you what glory is. Glory is kabod. It's, it's, um, some of you may have heard of Shekinah glory. It's not that. Kabod is like, um, weighty presence. It's weight of some, in fact, I've written down the first time that word appears. Let me see. Let me go back and look. It's, it's weight, splendor, honor, abundance, riches, dignity, reputation, reverence, you know, toward, toward that. Uh, it's, it's actually used when Jacob's brother-in-laws began to talk and say, Jacob is taking the wealth or the gain for himself from our father. What it's saying is that everything that Jacob touched prospered. In other words, everything that happened on that ranch, on Bonanza, the Ponderosa, everything that Jacob touched got a bigger harvest, better stuff. Now, now Laban was benefiting and Laban was prospering. He didn't want Jacob to leave because he was prospering. But he kept changing the rules on Jacob. And every time he changed the rules, Jacob's part was better because there's a distinction if God is with you. There's a distinction in your harvest. That was, that was the weighty presence as far as wealth or prospering was concerned. A glorious gain. So, so here's how the Lord responds to show me your glory. 33, 19. And the Lord said, Yahweh said, I am that I am said, I will cause all my goodness to pass in front of you. I will proclaim my name, the Lord. So that's Yahweh. I am that I am. In your presence, in your face, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy and I will have compassion on on whom I will have compassion. He said, show me your glory, and God gave his core attributes. 
The most glorious things in the universe are the very nature of God. Yes? So? So? My goodness. That means goodness. It's like Tob or something like that. I always, yeah, I'm afraid I'm going to say Toad like a frog. It's Tob, something. Something like that. I may not be pronouncing it properly in Hebrew. But it's everything that's good. And y'all have heard me do this before. Everything that's good. Hell is hell because God's not there, which means everything that's good is absent. In this earth, in the midst of all the horrible stuff that goes on, it's still good because God's presence is still on earth. No presence in hell, no good thing. Everything will be evil and wicked and depraved, abusive and oppressive. Everything that's death. Yeah, okay. So he's all that's good. Let's go back to the good part. All that's good in the widest sense, superlative, the very best, Beauty, gladness, welfare, good things, joy, go well with everybody for everything. Prosperity, that's goodness. He'll have his goodness pass by. First time it's used is when um, uh, let, me, let me make sure I'm doing this. Abraham sends his servant with the camels to go with a bride price to bring back a bride for Isaac because he loaded them with good things. Those camels only had good things packed on them. Right, Grace? Recompense. Good things, double portions, good things, goodly things went on those camels to bring back a wife for Isaac. Um, Then he says, my mercy... Mercy is, y'all have heard me do this before, mercy is to bend, a superior bends, stoops down, and takes an inferior in love. Every time you pick up a child, a superior, there's no contest if there's a fight, right? We're in bad shape if we're losing to a five-year-old or a three-year-old or one-year-old. It, although I often do lose. <laughs> Willa do not even look at Angie anymore to check and see if it's right. She just goes, no, Dan. <laughs> so, so you bend down and you stoop and you pick up. You hold this one, this inferior, in a loving embrace. That's the mercy of God. Mercy. He bends himself down, stoops down, to pick us up in a loving embrace. That's the picture of mercy. It means favor. It means to bestow favor. It means graciousness, merciful, have pity on, to show someone consideration. And the first time it's used is Esau sees Jacob with his entourage and Jacob they, they talk about how Jacob has so many children and he says, God has graciously given me these children. They're coming from the mercy of God. And then compassion. That's to love, to love deeply, to have mercy on, have tender affection for one. Again, to cherish. Talked earlier about that grace word having preciousness in it and this has cherish in it. The first time it's used is right now. Right now is the first use. God says, I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. I love deeply. I love deeply. So, that's his response to show me your glory. Then he says to Moses, verses 20 and 21, but 
You can't see my face, for no one may see me and live, which is a real, a real problem. Because Moses does see his face, and he's even told Moses, you live in my face, and my name's in your face. But there's something that he's referring to about his face, and there are different ideas about it. Uh, it just, just in script. For example, do you remember this? Do y'all know who Manoah is? Manoah? It's, he, he'll be the father of Samson. And it doesn't name the mom who really does all the heavy lifting in the story. <laughs> the, the Lord appears to the mom and says, I'm going to have this son. I want you to give him the Nazarite vow. But dad's not there. And so they pray and ask that the guy will come back and talk to dad, Manoah. And he talks to him, and then he's trying to say, well, tell us your name. And he says, my name is too wonderful. And there's a hint, because it says his name's wonderful. And, and then he's saying, can we cook something for you? And he said, well, I'm not going to eat, but I cook it. And he says, you can cook it. But then he ascends. He goes up in the smoke, right? And then Manoah says, we're going to die. His lightning quick mind realizes he's seen God and he's going to this verse, no man may see the face of God and live. And so he goes immediately to we're going to die and the woman has to say, uh, idiot, no, husband, <laughs> loving husband, God would not come to us and tell us this amazing thing. He's going to give us this child to do this thing, to be anointed, to lead the people if he's going to kill us. Right? You remember that? So, so there's something else going on in this verse, right? And in fact, probably the one that, that um, now some people think that when it says that he sits face to face with God, that somehow God covered his face. I think he's sitting with Jesus. You know, the tent of meeting, when the, when the cloud comes down, the pillar cloud comes down, and, and he's meeting with God inside the tent of meeting, and Joshua's at the door. I think he's meeting with Jesus. It's just my personal opinion. Some other people have that opinion, but not everybody. So he says, you can't see my face, whatever that means, but there's a place near me where you may stand on a rock. So that's why Kevin has this rock thing here in the cleft of the rock. Um, 33, 22, and 23, when my glory passes by, so he's responded about the character, his character is his glory, but now he's going to bring his glory passing by. I will put you in a fissure or a cleft, a parting in the rock. He's going to hide him in a rock and cover you with my hand until I pass by. Then I'll remove my hand and you'll see my back. Some of your translations say hinder parts. Any of you got hinder parts? Just check your, your like, hinder parts. Anybody got hinder parts? Nobody's got hinder parts. What kind of translations you people read? <laughs> there's, some, there's some hinder parts out there. But my face must not be seen. Let me, let me just look. Let me, let me tell you something real quick. I didn't go back and check it, which is always a little scary. Let me look right here. Okay. The hinder parts does mean back, but it also means the prophetic. And just, just consider this. I can't tell you this is for sure what took place, but just there are some people who believe that in that moment, I'm still here. So, is it time to eat? No, no it's not time to eat. Mm, I was hoping it was time to eat because we're going to stop so I could go eat. Um, so some people believe that what that saying is and because of that thing with the prophetic, you know, when you, when you have the prophetic, you can do things like go places because the Lord can show you things. Time doesn't matter because you're with the Lord, right? 
so Moses could go back to Adam to write Genesis because he starts with Exodus. That's where he enters the story. But he can go back and be an eyewitness of Genesis. He knew stories about back there because they had passed an oral tradition on, but the Lord could literally take him there so he could see it, so he could record it. And he could also take him into the future and he could show up on a mountain with Elijah and Jesus, who is the glory of God. And while he's there, Peter, James, and John are pressed to the earth and can't get up in the glory where Jesus turned up the dimmer switch. Does that make sense? I'm not saying that's what happened, but I'm saying the wording allows that to happen. It's not saying that happened. But some people think he got transported back so he could write what led up to his entry into the story and also went forward because he asked to see God's glory. He met face to face with Jesus and then was able to also see him in his glory. And in that context, on that mountain, with Moses and Elijah standing there, God said, this is my beloved son. Listen to him. In other words, all the law and the prophets are fulfilled in him. This is my glory. Right? So one more thing here. I said in John chapter 1, it says, Moses came with the law. Jesus, the son, came with grace and truth, right? It's a much better covenant. And in fact, it also says, I think that's verse 17. John 1 verse 14 talks about the word, which is Jesus. It talks about glory, and it talks about the Son, also Jesus. So in that one verse, it's talking about the glory with the Word and the Son, and it says that he's full. He is the fullness of grace, favor, and truth. So think about this. For Moses, he had to stand in the cleft of the rock for the presence of God to pass by. But you get to stand on the rock that is his church built on the foundation that Jesus is God. You are the Christ, the son of the living God. Standing before a rock cliff, which that rock Moses was in this rock place that he's put in a fissure, in a cleft. Jesus, in this covenant, takes us out of the cleft and stands us as his ecclesia on the rock because the glory of God is Jesus. And we stand on the glory of God. And as those who stand on the glory of God, we've got keys that open things and lock things so that things in the heavenlies are released on earth and things that don't belong in the heavenlies are locked on earth. Right? And the hand that now covers you is the hand with your engra engraved name on his hand with a hole right there. That's the hand that covers you. And you are those hands in this earth to show the glory of God to those who don't yet know him. You are his glory. For the joy set before him, Jesus endured the cross. 
You are the joy set before him. He said, when you pray anything according to his will, he says yes to do it to make your joy complete. And what does that do? It glorifies my Father. You are his glory on this earth. You want to see his glory? All of you start doing the Superman pose. You are his glory. Step in it. Step in it. Walk in it. Decree it. Make sure you're on his path when you're doing it. You don't want it to burn you alive, right? One more thing. Pass by. Say that word until I've passed by. Pass by. That word is interesting because it's the word for how the wind came to push off the water for the ark to rest. It's, it's the word for making the water recede, which is interesting, pass by. Pass by. How do you get? So you're making the waters pass. But how about this image? The wind that comes and drives the Red Sea into two walls so they can cross over. This means cross over. When my presence crosses over, you have crossed over because Moses saw this before the cross and you live on the other side of the cross. You live in the land of crossed over. He saw it in the future. You live it in your past. You stand in the land where his presence has crossed over. You live in the land where the death angel has passed over. You live in his grace and his mercy and his compassion. You live in his presence. You live in his glory. You are glory bearers. And we're about to step into a place that's going to be glorious beyond anything we've ever dreamed. It's 12.08. What's up with this? 12.08. I wish I'd stopped when you had the little thing. 12.08. I want to read something real quick. I'll try to read it quick. If you'll just like, if it's helpful to you, close your eyes. If it's not helpful to you, watch your neighbor. I don't, you know, whatever's helpful. If you're sitting beside some people, you may need to watch them instead of close your eyes. But if you can close your eyes and just sort of focus on this, this is from a couple of weeks ago. Jesus loves us. Jesus is fond of us. Jesus is full of goodwill for us. Jesus seeks our highest good. Jesus prefers us, and he surrounds us with his caring and unselfish love. Jesus takes pleasure in us. He loved us so much, he made us his reigning and ruling representative with his authority to govern on earth. Jesus gave himself up for us. He surrendered to our enemy. He let our adversaries take custody of him. He was falsely accused. He was judged. He was condemned. He was abused. He was mocked. He was scourged. He was tormented. And he was put to death on an execution stake for us. He did it to sanctify us, to make us pure, to make us holy, to set us apart. By the power of his intercession, Jesus separated us from profane things, and he dedicated us to our Father. Jesus cleansed us from all our stains and all our filth, and he freed us of all the defilement of sin and guilt. Jesus purified us and consecrated us. 
He washed us. He bathed us fully in his water. He cured us with his rhema word uttered by his living voice, declaring us now innocent and worthy. Jesus has placed us by his side, close at his hand. We are gloriously splendid in his presence. He has made us noble and radiant, gorgeous and honorable. The work of Jesus Christ is so complete in us that we are without spot or stain or fault or defect or disgrace or blemish. We have no wrinkles spoiling our appearance in any way. He has completely changed us from corruptible to incorruptible, from mortal to immortal, from natural to supernatural. We are now holy, pure, and set apart, totally faultless, totally unblameable. We are his chosen bride of grace and power. And Jesus says to us, you've not chosen me, but I have chosen you. I have appointed you, I've placed you, I've purposely planted you to go and bear fruit and to keep on bearing fruit. Your fruit will remain, your fruit will be lasting. So whatever you ask our Father in my name and my authority as my representative, our Father will give it to you. This is my command, love and unselfishly seek the best for one another. You are gloriously splendid, radiant as his bride. That's what he's done for us. The praise team can go ahead and come up. Sorry to take you over. I don't really know when I started, but this is one of my favorite passages, as you can tell. And we're on the way to more of my favorite passages. <laughs> get ready, get ready, get ready. Does everybody confess the Lord? Does everybody know the Lord? Everybody's saved. Nobody's going to hell in a handbasket. Right? Everybody's good. Okay. Well, in case you want to say it, I believe that Jesus is the Christ. Mm. The Son of the living God. My Savior. My Rescuer. <laughs> My Lord. My King. Amen. Well, I'm going to pray and we're going to eat and drink. This is his proof that he cherishes us. This is his proof that we're precious to him. This is his proof that we are different than we were before if we're believers. This is his proof that we, we live in grace. The bread and the cup. So Lord, we thank you for this bread that is representing your body. We thank you for what you endured physically in the natural for us. And we just declare over it, by your stripes we were healed. And we thank you also for the cup that represents your blood, freely given, that has redeemed us and made us as white as snow. Thank you for taking our harvest and giving us your harvest. Thank you for giving us grace and favor. Thank you for offering us your mercy and your compassion. Thank you for giving us your presence. And again, we say you alone are worthy, Lord. And we pray it in your name, Jesus. Amen.